Oh, thank you, Carol, all for your insightful questions and Jeffrey Sachs for your insights. Um, just wondering, uh, can you connect the dots, and if so, how, of what you call the collapse of decency, the new war on the poor, with the need, in ironic quotation marks, the need for and the conduct of the war on terror. I'm just really fascinated. War on, war on the poor at a time of war on terror and their trajectories match. America has uh, looked towards militarized answers for a long time. Uh, and uh, there is a kind of streak of uh, uh, American triumphalism that is deep in American society and it went from the cold it went from Vietnam and the Cold War conflicts uh, to uh, to to the war on terror um, so I think that uh, that's always lurking and we've had you know, our share of uh, incredibly wasteful efforts. I'm not sure that it's really timed uh, in this way. The war on terror started in 2001, uh, the so-called war on terror. The, the trends that I'm talking about go back well before then, and uh, the, the rise of greed, the deregulation of, or the rise of, let's say, untrammeled greed. The greed's always been there, but uh, the rise of untrammeled greed started in the 1980s. Um, so I'm not sure, sorry, I'm fumbling with it. Uh, I don't really see it as the same thing because I see the problems uh, having deeper roots. I see this uh, war phenomenon, of course, that also has its traditions in America. But the reason I rate George Bush as the worst president in the 20th century, certainly, in 21st century, I should say, uh, but in at least a, you know, a 150 years, uh, is um, that he launched a war, and a massive war, on the basis of lies. Uh, and America had not really done that. We had uh, fallen into confusion and uh, terrible, uh, uh, misunderstandings and the lack of understanding of wars of anti-colonial origin from Cold War and lots of things that America had a hard time disentangling in, in Vietnam. But Iraq was really something different. Uh, it was completely unnecessary. It was disastrous. Uh, it was rolled out like a, a, a new product campaign, you'll remember. Uh, it was manipulative. Uh, of course, we've also never had anyone like Dick Cheney in high office before. <laughs> uh, really a terrible, terrible person. Uh, and uh, they, they created a lot of damage. What I might think I'm going to do, because we're very short of time, I'm going to take um, three questions at a time, and we'll look for some common themes, if that's all right with you. So next three, please come and get us. Okay. Yeah. Um, I wanted to ask a question about um, your views on the North American economy. Uh, two of your professional colleagues tonight are debating somewhere else here in Toronto, about those being Paul Krugman and Larry Summers. Um, yeah, you guys are lucky. You're hearing the right answer here. Uh -huh. <laughs> Over there. They're both wrong, and I'll tell you why in a okay. moment. I wanted to get your sense on whether or not it is, you know, the, 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 the question posed to them is whether we're in for a, you know, a prolonged time of Japan-style deflation with uh, high unemployment and low growth. And then the second part of my question is, given that some people see this, you know, problem with the economy as being uh, connected to the f over, over financialization of the economy, how could we throw sands in the wheels of global finance. Oh, okay. All right, I'm going to take the next question. Hi. Um, thank you for coming down here. My name is Sushila. Um, my question has to do with political reform. So often when we're presented with how do we engage in politics, we're told to 
you know, vote and join the system. But the way that I see things is that um, it kind of perpetuates that same political culture. So and the same way of getting up to the top and the same kind of mannerisms once you're at the top. So what are the things that we need to be doing from the outside to be really fostering uh, political change to encourage, well, not to encourage, but to actually create a real democracy? Great. Great. Okay, I'll just take one more question and then we'll just um, hold this together. Sorry. Uh, hi, thank you very much for coming. Um, I've been uh, watching a number of, this is quite silly given the nature of this conversation, but like on YouTube, these videos about um, the possibility of a constitutional convention in the United States. And I was wondering how what, how likely that possibility is or is not. Great, okay. thanks. So um, do, do you have some themes? Because I've sort of just talked No, those are three to... huge different questions. <laughs> uh, I was going to with pretend absolutely no that common they were theme. common themes. <laughs> And, but they're great ones, so let me, uh, let me discuss them uh, very quickly, if I could. Um, here's what you would hear wrong if you were in that other place. Uh, both uh, Larry and Paul, who are colleagues of mine back to graduate school days, are taking what's called a Keynesian view of this crisis. A Keynesian view, named after John Maynard Keynes, says that the reason we have a slump is that demand is insufficient. And the role of government is to boost demand. In my view, they're wrong. Our problems are structural problems. Our problems are about investment. Our problems are about skills, about education, about energy systems, not about demand. We actually put a lot of demand into the system in 2009. I was against it. But we had the stimulus, which raised the deficit in the United States to $1.6 trillion, 11% of GNP. Interest rates were reduced to zero. The Fed pumped in $2 trillion of liquidity. Nothing happened. I just think they're wrong. Paul Krugman says, well, we should have had 15% of GNP deficit, 20%. I think he should rather ask, why was this medicine so poor? And Summers basically is, was in the forefront of the financial deregulation 10 years ago and still is exemplifying Wall Street views and values and played, in my view, a really unhelpful role in stopping addressing issues that are structural like climate change and energy policy. That's not his thing. So I think they're both wrong, actually, because the whole point I'm trying to make is government is not about turning dials for aggregate demand. It's actually about providing investments and services for skills, for environment, for things we need. And my wife, who's a, a, a clinical uh, pediatrician, to my mind, epitomized exactly the right understanding of this when we were discussing one day what I viewed as a completely sterile but typical macroeconomist debate. And I come from that tribe. I just know why it's wrong now after having done this and observed this for 30 years. One was saying, you know, the multiplier on spending is 1.4, we should spend more. And the other said, no, uh, the tax multiplier is 1.2, we should cut taxes, et cetera, et cetera. And my wife said, well, Spending or taxes, they were, doesn't it matter whether we actually need the bridge that they're talking about? You know, isn't it what you're spending on? Not just whether it's demand up and down. That's what macroeconomics forgot. It's all tricks right now. It's all financial. It's all this. It's not the real economy. And our problem is structural. We've got kids that don't have the skills they need. We have about 68% of our 25 to 29 year olds without a bachelor's degree and try to get a decent job in the world economy like that right now. Of Hispanic young men, 25 to 29, only 11% have a bachelor's degree. That's a lot of poverty built into that. This isn't about aggregate demand. This is about the role of government and society. That's why you'd hear the wrong stuff in that debate. 
Now that does relate to Japanization. Our problems aren't going to be solved by what we do with the bank balance sheets and this and that. That's what economists love to talk about. It's about how we invest in our future, the skills we build, the infrastructure, the energy systems, how we can compete internationally. Why manufacturing employment peaked at 19 million in 1979 and is 10 million today? Why it is that our manufacturing sector is crying out for about 600,000 skilled jobs they cannot fill in the United States right now? Because the systems engineers, the machinists, the skilled craftsmen aren't being trained in the United States right now. That's what government is about, not aggregate demand. And I was trained in that other way. There are moments when that's true, but you don't use Keynesian stimulus for a long-term problem solving. For that, you need to raise government spending properly directed and tax rich people and companies to pay for that. Not in one or two years, but over the course of a decade to reform the country. What about fixing politics? Okay, here I'll link the two and Constitutional Convention. The, here's our problem. Our problem is money took over politics. Our politicians don't hear the average voter. They have this duopoly where they can both be semi-absurd or fully absurd. But it doesn't matter because they're competing on image far to the right of the center of where America really is. And that's what their big campaign donors and the lobbies want. So we have to rescue politics from that. One strategy for a long time has been campaign finance reform. We have two problems with that. One, Washington is not going to reform itself. Second, we have a Supreme Court even worse than Congress. Five right-wing Supreme Court justices can't tell the difference of corporate anonymous donations and free speech. So they legalized every anonymous corporate donation without constraint as part of the First Amendment and nearly gave apoplexy to poor Justice Stevens, who wrote the dissent. You read that dissent, it's called Citizens United. It's online, you can Google it. It's amazing to read the dissent. It's this poor, justice, beautiful man saying, I can't believe you've just thrown out 110 years of law and our historic tradition and our constitutional tradition in this country for these corporate interests, which is exactly what the Supreme Court did. So what do we do? Because it's really tricky. So I have a theory, but unfortunately it's only a theory. But it's also a campaign I'm trying to start. And I call it the $99 pledge for the 99%. I want a new generation of candidates to run on the pledge that they will take no more than $99 from any donor. No, no PACs, no super PACs, no bundlers, no wealthy campaign contributors, 99 bucks. And then we're all going to use Twitter and Facebook and YouTube and every other thing we can do to give them maximum publicity. And you're going to tell your neighbors, what, you're not on YouTube? Get on YouTube, go look at this. And we're going to show that you can run a campaign, even for President of the United States, without a billion dollar war chest. And by the way, if a million Americans give $99, that's $99 million and that'll cover the gas fare. <laughs> and that's enough. And what I'd like Obama to do, but he's not going to do it because David Plouffe is there and I want David Plouffe to go home so that Obama could hear me. <laughs> and that is to say, okay, no more $35,800 dinners. I'm just going to talk to the American people. I'm going to begin governing. It's a little bit late. But I'm going to start governing, and I'm not going to be on the take. And then we'll all reelect him. That's how he should really run and how he'd get the biggest margin of victory. Because it doesn't matter what the other side does when you prove you're not on the take. The president can get publicity, by the way. He doesn't need to raise campaign funds to get publicity. Somebody will tweet him. 
It's true our Constitution is a bit archaic, actually, in some key areas right now. It was made in 1787. Great stuff. But it's got some weird things in it also, like running a national election every two years. That can drive you crazy in the media age. And so we do have some things that should change, but I wouldn't do it through a constitutional convention. Okay. I uh, have noted that a lot of the problems we seem to discuss either here or with the, the Occupy movements all seem to boil down to the concept of full cost accounting. But that is something that I don't hear about anywhere, really, except at home at the dinner table. And I was wondering, first of all, how well known is it? And how important do you think getting the concept out would be? Because I've been trying to plot sort of crazy media campaigns. And I wonder if I'm wasting time or if it's really important. That's it. I don't even know what that is. But anyway, we'll get, to, we'll, get, we'll get to the other two questions and then we can uh, let people sit down. Thank you, Mr. Sachs, for taking my question. Um, some people feel that government spending may be a problem rather than a solution, given the state of Greece lately and Italy and the other Eurozone countries. Can you give us your opinion on the Eurozone problem and what is the solution if there is one? All right, Thank you. great, okay. Small questions, these are small things. Um, at the beginning of your speech, you mentioned the Occupy movement being a step in the right direction. Some may argue if it's a very effective step. Um, could sorry, you? Which, sorry, which step? Oh, sorry, the, the Occupy movement? An effective step? If, it, if, it's, if it's an effective step taken by the masses, what would you recommend that the, the masses do, um, I guess, to actually bring about the change? Yeah. That you want Another to small question. All right. Okay. <laughs> Good, thank you. You know, uh, full cost accounting applied to environmental goods means that you measure the environmental damages uh, and you take into account, for example, that when we burn the oil sands, uh, both to produce them and then ultimately to, uh, to use the energy, you release carbon dioxide that creates greenhouse gases that warms the planet and, and deranges the climate in other ways and imposes huge costs and so in a way, for things like pollutants and greenhouse gases and many other areas of environmental degradation, full cost accounting would uh, apply. Similarly, when we uh, fill the gas tank right now, we're also uh, not taking into account that we're paying for the Sixth Fleet, trillions of dollars of uh, war and, and so on. So in, in a sense, there's a lot of uh, um, uh, truth to the idea that if we knew more and measured more of the non-market as well as the market effects, we'd get closer to where we need to be. And this is the idea of a carbon tax, for example, which is a right idea. It's a correct idea. It doesn't solve all the problems, but it would help to solve what we call market failures, uh, areas where market prices give the wrong signals. And there are a lot of them. Uh, and this, this is part of what full cost accounting can, can address. The big problem with government spending is if you don't pay for it with taxation. So running large deficits is a big problem because you end up with a lot of debt. And eventually, you end up either insolvent or printing money or in a financial crisis and so on. The countries that I most admire in economic management spend a tremendous amount of money on government. Those are the northern European countries, Sweden, Finland, Norway, Denmark, Netherlands. Their spending on GNP is bigger than Canada's, bigger, well, way bigger than the United States. It's maybe about 45% of national income spent through government. A lot is on social transfers, but also investments in education, in health care, in clean energy, and so on. But they don't run big budget deficits because they tax themselves a lot. And interestingly, if you want to win an election in, in Sweden, you have to convince the electorate you will not cut their taxes. <laughs> because they say, you know, he's going to cut your taxes and cut the programs you like. No, I'm not. I'm not going to cut your taxes. <laughs> oh, my God. It would be like a comedy show in the US. <laughs> 
But that's how real elections are run in Sweden, and they live very, very nicely. Very nicely. So the problem in Southern Europe is that they spent, but they didn't collect taxes. The problem in Ireland is that they had a private sector bubble of corrupted banks, Anglo-Irish Bank and, and others. And then when those banks went belly up, the government took uh, those banks uh, under its wing and, and uh, promised to repay all of the borrowing of those banks, even though those were private loans. So it bailed out what are called the senior uh, unsecured bondholders of, of uh, Anglo-Irish Bank. And that's a huge burden for Ireland. It, it became a big fiscal crisis. The problem in the United States is our spending as a share of GNP is rather low compared to other high-income countries because we don't give support to poor families. We don't invest properly in infrastructure and so on. But our taxes are much, much lower for all the reasons we discussed. And that's why we have these big deficits. And the Keynesians, like Paul Krugman, say, don't worry. I'm worried. But I don't say, therefore, cut spending. I say, therefore, raise taxes. Because we need that government, not for aggregate demand, but for decency, for productivity, for environmental sustainability. So the, the problem in, in Europe is that a lot of the southern European countries didn't pay their way. They're not hugely competitive. They have big budget deficits. And Europe has, it's been very sad. I've been involved in, in uh, watching close up uh, the unfolding of this crisis. And Europe just hasn't taken care of itself properly uh, because Germany's the main creditor and German politics doesn't really want to help Greece as, it, as German politics should but it doesn't want to, so they just haven't been able to really come to a decent solution. But good news, Berlusconi's gone. <laughs> so don't say that good things can't happen. <laughs> One of the first rate disasters in this world. I talk about the problems of, of the media and the corruption of politics, and they put it all together in one person. <laughs> And it showed how bad it can do. It can destroy a country of around 60 million people. Uh, he's gone. And Mario Monti is a good friend of mine. He's the new prime minister, really decent. At least there's some good news, ladies and gentlemen. Finally, what to do. Um, yesterday, I published a piece in the New York Times, which I would like you to look at, called The New Progressive Movement. And again, I try to go back to the roots of American history, as I mentioned earlier. We've been here before. We've had our Gilded Age. We had our robber barons. And we brought them under control. It's not from one day to the next. The progressive movement started in 1892. And it lasted roughly till 1917. It produced two great presidents. Woodrow Wilson and uh, Teddy Roosevelt. Roosevelt exemplifies a certain kind of politician. Wealthy, came from that class, knew it, understood it, wasn't impressed, and said, you are going to be under control. And he wrestled them down. And then came World War I. Then came the Roaring Twenties and everything goes, and we went back to soaring inequality and speculation, and it all crashed in October 1929 under Hoover, and America was saved again, and in a way, I think the world was saved by the greatest president we ever had, Franklin Roosevelt. And he was the one that established fully the decency that made America able to prevail in World War II, together with, the, of course, uh, the Soviet Union and other allies, and create a decent society afterwards. We've been there. America has, and Canada, of course, uh, of course, the same way, we have strong, self-correcting potential. 
We also have what Arthur Schlesinger Jr., one of our great historians, late uh, historian, said was long waves between public purpose and private purpose. And we've been on a 30-year wave of private purpose, and we're in the ditch right now. And it's very bad and very dangerous. But we're going to get out of the ditch, because the kids out in the park that I just visited a few minutes ago are going to help us get out of the ditch. The kids in Zakoti Park are going to help us get out of the ditch. We're going to elect candidates who don't take large campaign contributions. We're going to reclaim the democracy and we're going to find out that we have a strong future for everybody in our countries. The book is... The book, the book is... The book is The Price of Civilization. It is must reading. Jeffrey Sachs, thank you for this book and thank you for being here tonight. My pleasure and thank you.